about it. Okay, so uh, today we are uh, advancing our knowledge and we're using, going to talk about traits and generics. So this is a bit more advanced than like the basics, but um, Rust handles it quite easily compared to a few other languages that uh, have, have uh, traits and generics, well, at least generics. And we will also have some basics discussions around lifetimes. Um, and the reason we're not going to go very deep there is because it's uh, not something you have to touch very often and it's quite hard to get a grasp on it. So it's just very good to be introduced to it and have some uh, basic examples. And then in the case where you need to understand it more, you can do some research on your own and at least you know sort of what you're looking for. Um, and then if there's time, we will try to do cover a little bit of collections today as well, since um, collections are in a way uh, generic containers and they use traits. So uh, if there's time, we will have a look at the collections as well. Uh, but let's start with uh, what's a generic. Uh, so have anyone used generics in other languages or are familiar with the concept? Uh, just type in the chat while I yes or no if while I keep going. Uh, so a generic is a way to implement a type or a function, and you can do that using a generic type parameter, like as opposed to a function parameter that has a specific type, like an integer or a string. Um, using generics, you can have the type of the argument be a parameter instead of um, instead of just uh, the value of it. Uh, and then that allows the compiler to create the actual implementation of the function. And you sort of just uh, generically define what the function should do. So if we wanted to multiply the number n by n, and the n could be any number, like an integer, a float, a byte, uh, anything, uh, we can use a regular function for that or a generic function for that. So we will look at both. Um, so um, this is a quick uh, generic example, but we will uh, uh, look at this in code in more detail soon. But uh, one of the main clues of, and the reasons for using generics is because you don't want to repeat yourself like too much. Um, you want to write code that's easier to maintain. So sometimes having a generic functions, function that handles everything in one place can be a lot better than having to maintain 12 different functions for multiplying integers, floats, uh, bytes, uh, signed and unsigned variants of those. Uh, so instead of maintaining all of those functions, you will end up maintaining just one of them. And of course, sometimes maintaining just one function that should be generic for many types can be harder <laughs> just because there's a lot of things to take into consideration. But um, as we will see today, uh, Rust uh, has some tools that allows us to restrict ourselves in how much genericness, if you want to say it that way, that we need to deal with. So we can reduce code bloat, gener defining a single implementation on the type parameter. So again, instead of sending the value 5 to a function, we can send integer and say that, hey, this function should use an integer, and then the value. So we can uh, have it ge uh, generic on both the value and the type. It can increase the speed of the program and not of the development. Since the compiler can know and the, the code knows more at compile time as opposed to dynamic polymorphism. So for example, if you have inheritance in a object-oriented language and you have uh, multiple functions that uh, process different types, um, then instead at the generics are known at compile time. So the compiler at runtime, you don't have to go and look up the type of the parameter and then move on and figure out uh, the next step. And like I mentioned, less repetition can reduce errors and tricky debugging, but it can also increase uh, errors and make debugging trickier, especially in, if, uh, if you're not careful. But, uh, and then some reasons why we should not use them. It 
in a language, it can increase the complexity quite a bit since and make learning the language harder since uh, usually every language has its own notion of uh, syntax for generics. Uh, it can vary quite a lot. Um, so it's harder to learn. It can be very hard to debug because now you suddenly have to debug this function for 10 types instead of just the one type and you know exactly what that type can do. And that depends on the implementation of generics in the language. So uh, I want to say that Rust has a very good take on this uh, that makes it easier to debug, at least than C++, which has generics implemented as templates. And the template language in C++ is basically its own programming language, like it's uh, Turing complete. So you can technically write everything with just the template system. So you can have programs at compile time that play Pac-Man with the compiler, like the compiler can play its own game of Pac-Man. There's a crazy guy who's done that before. Or you can solve Sudoku while compiling the program. And then when you run it, it's just already solved. So, and that's definitely a hard way of uh, doing generics, but it's of course uh, very powerful as well. Um, it can add a, quite a bit of compile time overhead because uh, when you make the compiler do the work for you, you make you forcing it to write the functions for you. Uh, then the compiler has to do more work, and uh, that takes compile time. But uh, usually, like the runtime benefits can be worth it um, since. Compile time is once, and then depending on how many people use your code, that can be forever. So, but for really big projects, uh, compile time can uh, add up if there's a lot and lots of generics. So, Golang historically did not used to have generics because it was supposed to be a simple language. Uh, they did not want to have complexity and they wanted people to pick it up fast. But quite recently, like in 1.18, they added generics, so now Golang also has it. But uh, so clearly, like the need for uh, not having to write ten functions, like oh, eventually overshadowed the need for simplicity. So I haven't used the uh, generics in Golang yet, but maybe you've looked at it in the cloud course this year. But uh, at least they have it now. So, but originally they didn't want to have it because of the complexity. Um, so, if we take a look at the basic syntax, uh, look at the stuff in orange. Uh, your normal functions would just be name and then parentheses a and then, for example, integer, b integer returns an integer. Uh, but in this case, we have to say we want to have a type parameter as well. So now a is a value and the type of that value is, uh, is t. So we can make it an integer. And then a has to be an integ integer value. Uh, we can have multiple type parameters, just like we can have multiple value parameters. So we have t, u, and v, and a is a t, b is a u, and c is a v. We can also do it for structs. So we can say that point uh, has a type t inside of it, and then it says x, y are both t's. Or we can have multiple ones in. Uh, in a point as well, have separate value types. That's the basic syntax. We will look at examples. So, so this also works for enums. For example, enum can have a name, can be a name enum, and has a T and a U, and be, for example, DNS and URI. So, and this is like what we looked at in the error handling. That's exactly how result TE and option T works. So, uh, with that logic, you have already been using generics and traits, um, maybe without knowing it. But uh, that is also another thing about why generics. Um, while it is hard to learn and hard to debug, using generics at least should generally always be easy. And if a language is able to have simple to use generics that feel intuitive, it, then it's then it sort of justifies that it's hard to write them and learn them because most of the time you will only be using them and uh, 
it's the same same logic as like yeah you can it takes a minute extra to compile but then a million users will use your program a hundred thousand times and it sort of doesn't matter because majority of time is spent using it so so since you've already used it without necessarily knowing um that clearly means that uh, it's quite easy to use use them in rust and so the next step is actually writing them yourself and familiarizing yourself with that. So, but uh, if uh, if it's easy to use it, then that's generally a good sign in terms of the design of the language. And even C++ has easy to use templates and hard to write ones. Um, nice. So before we move on, let's do some examples in code uh, with uh, generics. So we mentioned that one of the main reasons to do it is not having to repeat ourselves. So let's say we wanted to write our first program ever, which is a program that adds two numbers together. We could simply go ahead and say that the sum is two plus five, but let's be a little bit more interesting and make sure this is a function so we can so we can reuse it later and not have to repeat ourselves. So the first thing, a uh, way uh, you cannot repeat yourself in code, like instead of having to do this every time, of course, this example is trivial, but uh, if you had to compute a more advanced sum, uh, you would write a function. So, so let's add ints. So we would take A, B, both of them would be integers. And the sum of the two integers is, of course, an integer. So, and then we would add them together. And now we have our function. So we don't have to write 2 plus 5 every single time we want to add two integers. We can instead type add ints. Of course, in this case, doing this is probably better. But uh, again, uh, it's an example. So let's replace this and say we want to add ints and we wanted two and five let's also print it at the end so we can actually have an output in our program and then let's call this sum f because we want it to be floats okay so if we were to run this Cargo run. Yeah, it's sum underscore f. We would say that the sums are 7 and 7.7, .7, which makes sense because 2 plus 5 is 7, and 2.5 plus 5.2 is 7.7. Uh, and here comes the second part. So if we also want to do this, add int. Some of you may already notice that this is not going to work because 2.5 is not an integer, but we are adding integers. So before we know about generics, we would have to go ahead and say, OK, well, I might need to add multiple floats together in the future. So I'll also add, add floats and change this to f32, f32, and f32. And then here I would call the other function. And now the program. Did I not? Uh, yeah, of course. There we go. And now if you run the program, we get exactly the same result. Um, let's make this even more interesting. Let's say these are F64s. And uh, whoops, we no longer can add these floating point numbers because they're 64s. So Again, process is the same, <laughs> keep going, and eventually this gets messy, right? It would be way easier if we could just uh, have the one function to add two things together. So if we get rid of everything, um, I wanted to do this in a generic way, which is the purpose of today. Uh, we can simply call it add instead. And if we remember the example from the earlier slide, we will say that this is a T. So it has a uh, 
type parameter in addition to the value parameters. We want A not to be an integer because we want to use it for floats as well. So we call it, give it the type T. And the T we can specify every time we call this function. But A is still a value. So A refers to the value and T refers to the type. And B is another value, but it's the same type T. So A and B have the same type T, but they have different values. And the return is still a T because these two values added together produces a type T. And then we could remove our various functions. And now we are left with just adding. Um, let's just do this as well. Uh, unfortunately, this is not going to compile. So I'll just go, go cargo build. And we get some, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not going to work because you can't add all t's together. So this is now generic on any type t, a plus b. So what if we were to call this with a weird type, like a struct of people, then that would not work. Uh, but before we look at how to fix that, let's just take a look at what the compiler basically does behind the scenes when we do this. So, so right now, add of t is technically defined for every single type you can possibly throw at this uh, from within Rust. It could be a string, numbers, IP addresses, results, options, like everything. Um, but the compiler is smart, so it, it doesn't actually end up creating all of those functions unless uh, you need them. So since we are using three versions of this function, one for integer, one for float64, and one for, let's just make sure this is a float32, and one for float64, the compiler will only create these three functions. So let's just have a look at what the compiler does so you understand behind the scenes. So when the compiler finds a use of your generic function add with t, it checks, OK, what's the type of the t? In this case, that's an integer. So what the compiler does that you don't have to do is it writes the function add underscore i32 for you and replaces the t's with i32. That's like the basic way of thinking about it. And the insides just becomes the same. So this is sort of what the compiler does. And then it does the same for the other one. It, it creates an add f32 and add f64 variant of add. And those are the functions that actually end up being called. Uh, but uh, as the programmer, you don't really need to know. You just know that you have add and it's generic. So what the, the compiler does behind the scenes is like uh, compiler does this behind the scenes. This is sort of what it does. Um, yet it, does, it still doesn't compile because we have not addressed everything. But before we go on, at least we can already see that right in this case, just having the one function to maintain for dealing with additions is a lot better than having to write a add function for every single type that can possibly be added together. Um, yes. So if there are any questions, anytime, of course. So that's the uh, main purpose and the, a very, the easiest way to get rid of duplicates is to just write the function to be generic. But uh, like we saw, it cannot compile. So to make this compile, we need to look at another topic that's relevant for generics. And that is a trait. So uh, suppose you're generic then, what is a trait? So a trait defines a behavior that types can choose to implement. And they can also have some other data associated with them. For example, they can have types themselves. Uh, so the mathematical operators, plus, minus, plus, equals, minus, equals, and everything else, have traits associated with them. So add, add a sign, sub, 
and sub assign, and then there's div, div assign, mult, and mult assign as well. Um, so already you might think, start to see that, aha, we, need the, we might need this trait to make our add function work. So uh, traits are similar to interfaces in li languages like uh, Java, but they are more powerful than, uh, than interfaces. So let's see, look at the basic syntax and write ourselves a quick example with traits as well. So like a struct, a trait is basically just uh, defined with the trait keyword, and then it looks uh, much the same. So let's go here, enter our score module, and then write our trait, which we will also call test. Traits don't have to have uh, generic parameters. They can be fine without, uh, but we, in this case, we will use it so we get used to everything. So we will give test a T and we will use this uh, interface or trait. So when you write a trait, you write, can write functions like this, and, but you don't necessarily implement them. You just say a, a test trait must have a function name that uh, returns a string reference, or for this example, just a string, and uh, has a re reference to self. So it's, uh, it's immutable, operates on an instance of self, and produces a string. And we also want the test to be able to score itself. And that should produce a score of type T. So we want the, a test to be scored on a type T. So for example, you can have letter scores or number scores, uh, percentages, like we, the, the test doesn't really care about that. But so this is sort of the, um, this is the parameters for what a test needs to be a test. Um, to implement a trait, we can do it for other types. So we can implement the trait test for our, our struct, which we will call a, let's call our struct an exam. Let's give it a name. And um, let's just call it an arbitrary amount of uh, points. And that's the basic. So we want to implement the test trait for our exam. Uh, and the way we do that is much like uh, we can, if you remember how to just implement a struct, we can do that with just impl and exam. So now we can create uh, methods and functions for our exam type. So I will quickly create a new that or new that takes a name and points and produces self. And then we want to create them um, with name and points. But except here, we have to make it an own resource since it's a string. So now we just created our constructor new that creates an exam. This is how we implement a function for the struct. But now we also want to implement our test trait. And the way we do that is with the same. We just implement our test for our type exam. Uh, however, since test also has a generic parameter, and that's why I wanted to add it, uh, we have to say that this is impl t for exam. Oh, this is, uh, and then we want to have, yeah, I guess we have to go like this. And then we have our name function. I used the uh, Alt enter, by the way, to just have it automatically fill out the remaining parts of the trait and our score. So, uh, and the reason we need impl to have t is because it also needs to know the type parameter. This implementation block it depends on the type parameter, and we need to implement it for test of t. So this implements it generically, 
but we actually only need to implement it for an integer. So we will implement i32, but we don't actually need to do it in that case, I think. We can just do this, yes. So we want to implement test using an integer for the exam type. And the name in this case is just, we want to return self.name. This is as a new, new, new own resource. And then on the score side, we want to say just self.points times two, for example. And T is not T anymore, it's I32 because uh, that's what we're doing. So we could implement it generically, but for the exam type, we only need to implement a straight for I32, which makes this an I32, since our points are specified that way. Now, for another exam, we might want to implement it for, we can also uh, implement it for like as a percentage. Say if we had the, not points, but max points as well. Um, then we would have to say max points. Um, but before we do that, let's go back. So this is how we, the basics of, of implementing a trait or a struct. Um, so if we here now, Actually, let's also remember to make this public. Public, um, let's also make the trait public. And then we create can create it here. So let's the exam, exam new, where the name is. Prog 2006 exam. Uh, the points is five and the max points is 12. And then we can print a test name and test score. And make sure we print exam.name and exam.score. And the reason this works now is because exam implements the trait. And then that means we have access to name and score. Uh, as part of that. But uh, we run into the same issue about this function not compiling, which we will fix very soon. Let's just comment that for now. And if we run this code by typing cargo run, we see that our test name is prog 2006 exam and our score is 10, which is twice the points. So let's look at how traits act in comparison to interfaces. Just a couple of things that make traits better and more powerful. So traits can be implemented multiple times for the same type. Okay. Let's have a look at that. So right now we've implemented the trait test once for exam for the type I32. We can also implement test F32, for example. And now we've implemented the same trait twice for, for exam. So the name will obviously be the same, but maybe we want to instead uh, format it so we know the difference and call it percentage. Um, otherwise, self the name. So now we call separate this by saying that this is name percentage and our score will instead be self at points divided by self at max points, but we need to convert these to floats just so we actually get a sensible division and then just time it by a hundred. So now we've implemented it twice. And that should make this, uh, uh, This is no longer obvious what we want to have since um, this can be both the first implementation or the second implementation. So uh, how do we separate them? Um, 
we see the compiler already suggesting here. So we can try to do that as test F32 name. See if it uh, enjoys that. Is that not what is suggested? So um, clearly there are some issues involved with doing this. So another thing I think we can do is uh, use uh, exam as test. And you have to do the same for the other one. No. Well, let's uh, leave the syntax for that out of it for now. But uh, uh, I can't remember the exact easy way to do it. But at least the point is that you can implement it twice for multiple types. Um, we can also have multiple traits with the same method names implemented for the same type. Uh, that's probably more interesting. So let's just create a trait name me that has a function name like so. And then we can also implement name me or exam. And uh, since that ends up doing the same thing, uh, we are allowed to implement it uh, twice. So I wonder if there's going to be the same issue here. So that needs to be a public trait, otherwise we cannot use it. And we probably will have the same issue now with name. Because now we have name from name me and name from there. And um, yeah. Wonder if this is going to do the job. And then there's two. Yes, that does the job. Then we will also want to separate them by saying, Uh, named like so. And then we should be able to separate them. So now, so that's pro that's a secret for the other one as well. So test F32 score and passing exam for that. Or not. I guess it's because of the generics, but uh, I will have to look it up it later and I'll post it to Discord because uh, it's quite possible to do so. Anyway, uh, so we can implement multiple traits that have the same things. We cannot do that with regular interfaces. Um, we can implement traits for types we didn't make as long as we define the trait. So what that means is we can we can implement test, for example, for i32, and we can implement it for i32. So we can say the name is then uh, int int self, and the score is self uh, times self, for example, because uh, yes. And then we, uh, since we are implementing it for an integer, uh, we are now allowed to do int, int test 
we are now allowed to do let x equals five, and we are now allowed to do x dot name and x dot score. Because the int we have now implemented our trait for the integer. We can run and we say our integer now produces the name int five and the score 25, which is integer by integer. So this can be quite powerful. Um, this can be used, for example, if you have a lot of math utilities that often apply to integers, you can, you can write traits and functions for those integers. Uh, they can be conditionally implemented based on some bounds. So the example here is that um, for a container, we can say that there's possible to say that um, we only want to implement the trait given clone for something if um, clone is satisfied for the element type as well. So um, there's an example here, and we can, if when we get to collections, we can look at it again. But uh, you can conditionally implement traits. Traits can also use implementing type and outputs and inputs, and Java interfaces generally cannot do what's above. Uh, and another thing that's different is that the type that implements a trait uh, is not said to be a trait. So if you implement animal, you are not you are not an animal, but you, your functionality maps to what an animal can do. So you you're not an animal in the object object oriented sense, but you can do the same as an animal in a way. That's uh, another thought difference. Um, so how to combine these things? Um, we can traits can be used with generics to create, for example, requirements on types. So that restricts the number of allowed types, uh, which brings us back to our first example. For example, since we couldn't add all, literally all types together in the first example, we need to say that there's a requirement on the type T that this type supports addition. And that's where the trait add comes in on the generic type T. So we can add two things. Uh, that's our function. Let's uh, go back to our code and finish it. That's all of this. And our add function. So before we said add any type T and do A plus B, but any type T cannot support the plus operation. So what we have to do is to restrict it. And the way we restrict it, it is with the colon and, for example, the and then we specify a trait. So the type T must implement the add trait. Um, but that alone is not enough because um, it says, uh, hey, we can add two Ts, but that doesn't guarantee that the output is also T. Uh, for example, if you take uh, today 904 and subtract uh, today at nine o'clock, then you would get four minutes. Is the, uh, then you would get a duration instead of a time. So subtracting two times produces a duration. So it's not always true that t and t produces t. So we have to also say that uh, the output type for add is also a t. And when we do that, then our program should once again run. Because now we've said that uh, our generic add function has a type T for A and B. Uh, the T must follow the add trait and must produce another T as the result. So if we run now, we see that our sums work 7, 7.7, 7.7. This is to make a difference, so it's obvious. Uh, our test name and that stuff is still the same. Uh, so that's great. Um, now we know that this works. Uh, additionally, there is a shorthand note for doing this if there's just one parameter. So if you want to just print something, we can use uh, reference impl, which means it must implement, and then a trait instead of the type. So if you want to have print anything, we can have the value and we can have it implement the display trait. And then we can use print line and simply pass the value. So now we could use print 
instead of using the print line here, we can just use print, print anything and pass the sum. Except we want a reference to the sum. So it doesn't have to be a reference, it can be a value as well. In which case we would do this. And then we could repeat that for sum, sum f and fs. And if we run it, we now get this. Um, so that's the way we can restrict it for one type. However, like this is not necessarily good because um, if we wanted to have a impl t, uh, impl add here. So now we have value. Let's say we want to re replicate this function. If I add to, we have value that implements add and value that imp implements add and then produces, and produces what exactly? Say integer. Uh, if you want to go value plus value B, uh, there is no guarantee here. So, uh, and the reason for that is uh, we don't enforce T. So value is just any value that can be added, but it doesn't specify how it's added or with what. And B is its own thing, so it can be a totally different type. So this only really works for uh, one, if you have one type parameter. Otherwise, you need the flexibility to specify the requirements. Uh, that being said, we can see, look at one more way to do the syntax. So add different. Um, sometimes, like we saw, we can have multiple parameters. We can have T and U. And in this case, if we, for example, wanted to add let some diff be an integer plus a float, um, then this wouldn't work because add the current generic implementation of add requires uh, our T to be the same type A and B. But uh, we can also do T and U and have two types. But then, of course, the question is also always, what's the output type? Um, so this uh, can require, again, uh, we can specify it here like we did before and keep going. Uh, but when you have lots of types, this can get messy. So there's another syntax as well that allows us to do it on the next line. So we can say where t. Uh, it's an add where the output is t, and we can say u is something that adds, and the output is also t is, for example, u. Now, if that works, uh, we'll have to see because the output type here can be we're saying that it's t but it might not actually be T. So if we try to run it, it's actually not working. Actually, it's this one that's not working, but that's fine. But uh, this also doesn't work because uh, we can't add T and U. So, and this is where generics start to get tricky to develop. Like sometimes you want to, so you can think maybe we want a W and say that the output type is W. And we specify it like that. Still doesn't work. So there's a, a mismatch types because necessarily an add cannot necessarily, T cannot necessarily be added with a U. So uh, there should be a way to specify that as well. I think T, U, uh, no. So, uh, so basically, uh, now I think this is uh, better. But uh, uh, yeah, this is where generics start to get trickier to develop because you have to think about all of the types, you have to know the traits. Uh, 
uh, and then it says here that uh, uh, so when we call this some different it does actually work now that it knows that we are trying to add a float to an integer but it also says that there is no function to add the float to an integer so that's the same as if we were just trying to do two plus three point three point uh, three uh, this would because floats and integers you don't add them in this way uh, so now the issue is different so maybe what we want instead is uh, to just uh, solve this as uh, uh, we get rid of our w type we say that the output is always t uh, and instead for our u type we want our u type to be convertible into t so maybe that's better and then we can call into maybe that works and uh, no it still doesn't work so so uh so this is where we have to do type thinking and uh, yeah, the compiler tries to help you. So it says from float is not implemented for integer. So again, this is just because uh, an integer from float is apparently not uh, satisfied. Um, so we can try to force it as a T, but there's no guarantee that's going to work. We can use the from trait and say, it can be converted from T and then or so essentially this uh, basically just demonstrates uh, the different thinking that you have to do when solving functions for generics. So I, we're, we're not going to spend more time on it, but um, as, a, as an exercise, you may want to see, try to solve how you can finish this. Um, so yeah, and we can, uh, the final case of uh, generics here is that we can use it on traits is that we can use it in the return types where we don't care about the type. So if we just wanted to produce printable value, uh, what did we use here? We don't even care. We just want to return something that implements debug. And we can produce any value here. Uh, and then if we if we print it, I call produce printable, and then we run it. Well, now we still have the issue with this one. Uh, we see that we we have it printed so because but here uh doing this adds a runtime overhead because the uh there's a dynamic dispatch where the comp where the program has to go and figure out which precise type is this and then call the call the debug formatter but uh, it's possible um yes um, so before we go to lifetimes, I think we should have a little bit of a break. Um, if you want, you can work on this a little bit. I will at least uh, just finish it in, during the break. And then, uh, then we will meet back in about 10 minutes. So at 9.25. Um, questions or discussion in the chat is welcomed. And uh, so see you in 10 minutes.
OK. Um, we are back. Uh, so for this final section, we will have look take a basic introduction to uh, lifetimes. So I will leave all of this in main, and then we will have a look at some lifetimes. So let's just be generics and traits, and then let's look at lifetimes. So uh, if anyone uh, did this, um, let me know. If not, uh, I will do it later. Um, so let's have a look at lifetimes. So lifetimes are used to assist the border checker, and it helps to ensure the correctness of your program. So uh, like we know, Rust does a lot of compile time safety checks to make sure that your program is as safe as uh, possible at the time you build it. So uh, for most programs and most everything we've written until now, mm, it's uh, handled implicitly behind the scenes. You don't need to think about it, uh, but it does happen. Mm. The exceptions are often related to references uh, and uh, generics as well. So sometimes when you have to specify them manually, like with type annotations, you have to do uh, the back apostrophe lifetime. And in code, it looks like it's in the same way place that type parameters appear, except it's a lifetime parameter now. And uh, this is then can then be used later to define what uh, references uh, belong to which lifetime. So. Uh, if we were to write a basic function for uh, with lifetime, that this just this takes a string. So let's make a string. It takes a string. And the only thing we do with it is the string. Uh, we can specify a lifetime A. Uh, right now it doesn't do anything. But if we assign it to the reference here, uh, then it's assigned. But uh, now we get uh, an error that says, hey, you're using in a lifetime where you don't have to do it. So you're essentially doing the work of the compiler. So we get rid of them. Uh, there are some cases where we don't need to. So uh, if we look, take a look at the, this uh, snippet right here, uh, when we create a new scope in our program, creates an implicit lifetime. So everything from this bracket to this bracket produces a lifetime. So we could call that lifetime A. And then when we get to these two brackets, we introduce a new lifetime that exists inside of this area. So that could be lifetime B. Uh, now R lives in A uh, and is assigned to inside of B. So here we create X, which is five. And then we assign to R a reference to X. Then we go out of lifetime B and try to print the value of R. Will that work? Um, so clearly it's a trick. Um, if we write it, uh, we create our R our other inner lifetime or scope. I create B to five and set R to a reference of B. And then we print R. And we try to build. And we get no. Um, this is the, the job of the borrow checker. Uh, in fact, we have lots of other issues as well because this is not comment, commented. Um, and uh, we have forgotten a semicolon. But here it is, here we go. So the issue is that B, the reference B, does not live long enough for R because R has, this is how long the variable R lives. And this is how long the variable B lives. But R is a reference to B. And 
because of that, R needs to live at least as long as B. So if we set B up here, then it would work. And we get that R is five, because even though this introduces a lifetime, there are no variables inside of here that are bound to it. We're just assigning in here, and that's all we do. Uh, if we did it the other way, however, and said that R equals five, and B equals a reference to R, and then print it in inside of here. Uh, it should also work because uh, now we are referring to a value that is in a bigger scope uh, than the inner one. So the borrow checker knows that this is valid and uh, we are allowed to borrow the value B in this scope because this scope is encased by the bigger one. So that's a valid uh, approach. Uh, so that's sort of implicit lifetimes that happen uh, without you thinking about it. It happens all the time. Uh, and, um, and you don't have to specify lifetimes in this case. So and uh, if we don't use references, we don't need lifetimes because uh, values can then be just be copied or moved around. Uh, but references need to know that what they're referring to is still is still alive. So it basically avoids null pointers if you uh, want to think about it that way, or null references. And these lifetimes are used to validate it. And in Rust, you will often sometimes actually find yourself using brackets like this in a strategic way to make sure that uh, sometimes you want to restrict the lifetime of something. But uh, we, in this case, we never have to really <coughs> um, specify it. So there are some rules for when we have to specify it. So we are now going to become uh, a compiler. So compiler. And then we add it at the module. So uh, with a compiler mindset when working with lifetime. So this is uh, how we know. Um, so the first step is think. In a function, each parameter that is a reference gets its own lifetime parameters. So we need to give this, uh, for example, add strings. And we can have a string. A, a, which is a reference to a string. Or we can call it double string. And this should return a string that is doubled. So let's say, uh, well, we should just return a for now. Um, so if we are the compiler, in a function, each parameter that is a reference gets its own lifetime parameter. So since we have one parameter, that should get the lifetime that we call A, um, conveniently. And then we give it to this. And that's the first rule. So now each parameter has gotten a lifetime parameter. Let's actually call it just value so it's not confusing. And let's make sure we also return it. Yeah, it's called value. Uh, second, if there's exactly one input, that lifetime is also assigned to the output lifetime parameters. So we have exactly one input, which means we can put the A on the exact on all of the outputs as well. It keeps complaining that uh, hey, we don't need to specify it here, but we're doing it. For example, right? Still compiles. So if we print this, um, let's use this function. Let's call our text equals hello world. And then we call our function double string uh, passing text. And let's also print it. Uh, So now if we run the code, we end up getting lifetime hello world. 
uh, since we pass text, which is a reference to a string in here, and it and that has the ref, the reference has the lifetime a, which in this case, since text lives here, the lifetime of that text is this space. So this is sort of what a refers to right now. If we moved it up here, uh, then this is a. Now this is the lifetime a. But uh, uh, that's just one thing. So this is the simple one. Uh, let's just call this, let's rename this to just return self. Um, and here we don't need to, uh, don't need to specify lifetimes. And the reason we don't do, have to do it is because the compiler has, after following the two rules, uh, we have already uh, determined all of the lifetimes. Since everything now has the lifetime successfully, then we, as a user, don't have to do it. There's a third rule as well. If uh, one of the parameters is self or mutable self, then the lifetime of self is assigned to all the output lifetime parameters, which we will look at uh, after. So, and if a lifetime is not accounted for after doing this procedure, then the developer needs to specify. So here, all of them are accounted for. We have this one, this one, and this one, that's everything. So here we don't have to do it. Uh, so let's uh, look at some examples. And th those examples are basically what we will spend the rest of the time on. Uh, so this is our first example, looks familiar. Um, Based on those rules, do we have to specify a lifetime for this function? Just type yes or no in the chat. Or if uh, it's in the big screen, I guess uh, the chat doesn't really work. Okay, well, anyway, uh, if we apply the rules, let's uh, see each parameter. Well, we already did this, like uh, it's it's this function, basically. So we already know that we don't have to specify lifetime here. That's the easy one. So let's have a look at the second one. Let's uh, write it down. Um, test example two. And what it does is it has two strings that returns a string. So A string B string return string. And if A length is greater than B's length, then return A. Then produce return A. Else we produce B. So basically return the longest string. Now let's apply the rules. So a compiler goes ahead and says each parameter gets its own lifetime parameter. Okay, so we have A, that's a, a, you don't have to call it A, you can call it like Bob or scope A or anything, but let's call it lifetime A and lifetime B. And we give A to this one and B to this one. So now we have done rule number one. Number two is if there's exactly one line input, that one is assigned to output. Uh, there's not exactly one input, there's two, so we can't assign anything here. And the third rule is the exception of self, uh, and we just, there's no self. So if a lifetime is not accounted for, we must do something. Uh, and since this one is not accounted for, we must do something. Because this function returns a reference to either A or B, but we don't know if it's A or B. It could be A or B. So for example, if we let text B be goodbye world, um, and we put this in a separate scope and then call this function. So if we call it in here, A and B have different lifetimes. Like this one is, lives in this scope and B lives in this scope. So those are the lifetimes A and B, but we wouldn't need know 
if we have our output we and we use uh example two with text and text b and then we want to print our output we don't know if um, if we get a reference to this one or this one as the output and this one has a different lifetime but output is stored in a but b lives in b and a is bigger than b so if we end up getting a reference to b here and try to print it uh, then that's not going to work so in this specific case we have to specify the output as well so if you specify a um then we get issues because uh, we might end up with b uh, but uh, so what we want to make sure of in this case when we do it manually is that we actually don't want a and b we just want a everything should have a and uh, so that means both a and b should have the same lifetime so oops that means uh, this function is uh all right because we are assigning the prints so that means uh right now if we try to run it they end up with the same life time and it works I remember last year, this was also a thing. Um, there was something interesting about this. I think that's because uh, secretly there is a, another lifetime in the world. Uh, and that's called a static lifetime. It's a special keyword. And both this one and this one even though they appear to live in this uh, scope, uh, they actually both live in a static lifetime, which is basically globally stored in your program because they are string references and they're string literals, like we are literally quoting the string here. So we can see that this value is already a reference. It's not a value. And that's uh, because this string is actually stored in static, like globally in the program. It's totally unbound by this lifetime so when the compiler goes here it sees that lifetime a is in fact the same lifetime because it's the lifetime of the whole program it's a static lifetime so it would be the same as if we wrote static that's a special keyword so it means that the, the it must be statically stored it's a reserved lifetime yes so i don't know if we can even do this we just have to do this uh, and then it works because these are both static. So, but we don't want want it to be. We want to demonstrate how not to do this. So let's uh, use string instead, because strings are dynamically allocated, so they don't live in the same place. And then just take references to the strings instead. And now we get the the error that we wanted, uh, and that's because text B does not have the same lifetime as text a like they do not share the lifetime and that and we don't know which one we return except that it should have lifetime a which then becomes the the biggest lifetime so to make this work we now have to move text b out here and then run it because now these two share the same lifetime and that's the main reason why you have to deal with lifetimes in code because to ensure that the references you're working with in a function can't live long enough. So in this case, we have to manually specify. So in the second example, we have to manually specify it. Uh, the third one is where we include a struct. So let's copy this one as well. Make it public, update that string. And then we want to implement it. With the example three, itself and other string. Uh, 
choose a U size and say now we just want to sum the length of our string plus the length of the other string and produce a total length. <laughs> so let's go back to our rules again. So each reference gets its own lifetime parameter. A, B, A, B. Uh, if there's one input parameter that is assigned to the outputs, uh, now, this is not a reference output, so we don't care about that in this case. And we also don't have exactly one input. We have two. But except if one of them is self, then the lifetime is self of self is assigned to the outputs. But again, we don't have outputs. So, so and since we don't have outputs, uh, we can see now that if a lifetime is not accounted for, well, all of these are accounted for. A has this one, and other has this one. And this one doesn't need it. So in this case, we don't need to specify here. So in the third example, we don't have to specify because everything is already accounted for. Uh, now, you don't actually have to go through these rules every single time you write something because the compiler will usually tell you, hey, we need you to specify lifetimes. But it's good to understand like uh, what determines it. So let's just look at. Uh, this final example, which is a cat struct that has a name and a hometown. Now we already get uh, a red uh, issue saying that, hey, we need to specify the lifetime. So, so in this case, um, we already know that, hey, we have to specify the lifetime here. So let's look at quickly how to specify lifetime for structs, because that's different from functions. So uh, like with a function, we can, we will, where we would usually put T on a struct, we can put A instead. And then we have to do the same here. So now we have a struct cat that has a lifetime A, because it refers to two strings, name and how, hometown, that cat does not own itself. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about structs is that when you specify a lifetime, you also have to remember to do that when you implement the structs. So we want to implement with a lifetime A or cat. And we have to say that it's cat with A. No, we don't have to do four because it's not a trait. Now we want to implement with a lifetime A for the cat with the lifetime A. And here we can just go function new. We can take a name reference and a hometown reference and produce a cat with name and hometown. Uh, this should return a self, capital S, which means the same type we're implementing for. And I think we can also say that these two should be A. So we can compile, it compiles. So now in here we can say uh, our let our cat be cat. We need to make it public. And let's make this public as well. And the cat struct public. So let's create a new cat. Uh, let's call it text and give it the hometown of text B. And uh, yeah, it found strings. So we have to just get the string reference to the string. So now let's change this to, uh, let's have the name of the cat be Rom and the hometown be Oslo. So now we have our cat. Uh, with name on hometown. So let's just print the cat, cat, cat name, cat hometown. Like so. And then when we're in the program, we now have our cat name. And we also print the longest of the two strings with our example too. So 
so when you specify an obstruct, uh, you have to do this. And when you implement for it, you have to do this. And likewise, if we want to implement, uh, let's say, the debug trait for cat A, we have to do it here as well. And then the debug is basically like this. And then we can also repeat this with just this, and we end up getting cat. Well, nice. So that's uh, that's the basics. Um, lifetimes can get confusing quickly. So, but uh, at least now you're somewhat familiar with it, and. Um, it's just something you have to learn as well by doing. So you can also have a look at these extra resources. Um, they are actually quite amusing to read. They're not specifically on lifetime, but they're entertaining and uh, uh, discusses how the compiler fights you, the borrow checker, uh, lots of different examples. Uh, it's It's a fun read, so I recommend it. And we don't have time to do collections, so we will do that uh, next time. Um, there's no menti for the quiz for this week, but uh, so if you have questions, we can just do Q and A in the chat right now. Uh, there, I, yeah, there's one thing I forgot, which is uh, if you want to limit something for multiple traits, like add. Uh, you can use the plus sign to limit it to be multiple things. So, for example, if you wanted this to be add integers only, we can use the add trait and plus the integer trait. And now, if we tried to build, it would fail for our float types. Or we could use a float, and then it would fail for our integer types if you want to write functions that only work on floats or integers. Um, so yeah, that's how you would do it for multiple ones. Um, I think that's it. That's it for today. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions, guys or girls? So in your experience, how how quickly you get sort of uh, friendly with the borrow checker? <laughs> uh, well, in a couple of uh, weeks, at least, you start to recognize what some of the errors mean, and that makes it makes it a lot faster to fix it. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it can be confusing, especially with uh, references passing up and down in function chains. Yeah, and sometimes you actually end up with references where you don't even where where they're not even visible like you might do a function call that ends up returning a reference and then you pass that on and then uh the borrow checker goes crazy uh, and then you actually have to create this like a separate variable i, I don't have an example right now but uh, text you might actually have to end up uh, copying the text to be able to work on a separate copy of it if you're doing chaining multiple operations, for example. Yeah, that, that, that's my experience as well, that I had yeah. to do um, explicit copying of certain uh, texts or uh, structs because I was using multiple functions on yeah. them, and then you can't really chain that easily. Yeah. Yeah. So in the beginning, I thought that was really annoying because i i know what i'm trying to do and i know it's safe but later on you start to appreciate that uh, it's actually nice to work on a clean and separate data set mm. but that's also one of the main differences from other languages that you actually end up with some extra copies but usually the copies aren't uh, a performance issue so fine yeah sounds good um, 
I will post slides and everything on the wiki and the questions can be directed on Discord as usual. And I will post the video as soon as it encodes and uh, we meet on Monday and we will talk collections, right? Yes, collections and also a little bit in smart pointers. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, see you. See ya.